I think I know most of you in the audience. You're probably tired of hearing me talk by now, so I won't keep you too long. Uh, but for those of you that don't know me, my name is Allison Rossi, and I've been the Director of Learning and Community Engagement here at the museum for a couple of months. And today I'm pleased to introduce you to my colleague, Dr. Natalie Panther, who is one of the curators of our current exhibition, After Removal, Rebuilding the Cherokee Nation, uh, for today's From My Point of View talk. Natalie is the program officer at the Helmerich Center for American Research. She received her doctorate from Oklahoma State University in American History. She was the 2014 recipient of the Oklahoma Historical Society's Award for Outstanding Dissertation on Oklahoma History for her dissertation to make us independent, the education of young men at the Cherokee Male Seminary. Her areas of scholarly interest include American Western history, Latin American history, American Indian history and education, and women's and gender studies. As program officer for the Helmerich Center, she has managed the Visiting Scholars Program, organized six scholarly symposia, served as the project manager for the exhibition's Plains Indian Art, created in community, and co-curated the exhibition after removal, Rebuilding the Cherokee Nation. She also teaches Native American history at OSU Tulsa, and she has a two-year-old son and a 10-year-old daughter. Dr. Panther's talk today is entitled, Preparing Us to Move in Higher Circles, Class, Ethnicity, and Identity at the Cherokee Male Seminary. And she will use the Cherokee Male Seminary as a case study for understanding class tension and ethnic diversity within 19th century Cherokee society. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Natalie Panther. Thank you so much, Allison, and thank you all um, for letting me be here today. It's an honor to be here talking for from my point of view. Can you all hear me? It seems quiet to me. Okay, okay so today we're discussing the Cherokee National Male Seminary, and we're going to be looking at how this school um, reflected larger issues and larger tension in the Cherokee tribe itself. To get started, we're going to look at class distinctions that had emerged among the Cherokees in 1835. And we're going to do this by looking at the federal Cherokee census of 1835. But let's get an idea of place before we look at that. Okay, in the early 1700s, the Cherokee controlled approximately 44,000 square miles of land comprising sections of nine different states. So you're looking at um, Kentucky, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Tennessee. Um, however, after a series of 36 land sessions, first with Great Britain and then after the revolution with the United States, their land base was whittled down to 12,316 square miles. And it's comp comprising sections of four states, northeastern Alabama, southeastern Tennessee, southwestern North Carolina, and northern Georgia. Okay, so a statistical analysis conducted by the late historian William McLaughlin of the 1835 Cherokee census has revealed that by 1835, a three-tiered class system was emerging, which consisted of a large, um, I'm sorry, a small, very wealthy social elite class, and then a sizable middle class and then a large low income class. Eric, you're making me nervous <laughs> with your camera. <laughs> okay, so the small wealthy class, and we're, we're talking about 42 families out of about 2,600 families. So this is a small proportion of the population who has um, an inordinate um, amount of wealth in the Cherokee Nation. Okay, census takers measured wealth in terms of land cultivated, a number of slaves owned, and livestock. 
Um, they couldn't measure it by land owned because, as you probably already know, the entire tri the, le the tribe owned the entire Cherokee land base. They had a dual system of land ownership where um, the individual would own anything on the land, so the fence, any structures you had, any plows, anything like that, that was yours, but the land itself was owned by the tribe. So this is how the census takers measured wealth. Okay, and they also measured um, the degree to which an individual or a family had acculturated to mainstream Anglo-American culture. And they did this by looking at the proportion of full-blood Cherokees in a community or in the state. And then they also looked at the proportion of English readers. And so what they found was in North Carolina, it had the highest percentage of full-bloods, almost 90%. And then as you can see, um, Tennessee had 56%, um, Alabama had 61%, and then Georgia has 81% full bloods. And then the number, the percentage of English readers, and you can see that in North Carolina it was the lowest, 1.5% of Cherokees in North Carolina could read, read English. And it's important to point out that a third of the tribe lived in North Carolina. Okay, and then 14% of the population in Tennessee, 15% in Atlanta, and 4% in Georgia could read English. Okay, and so the areas with the highest proportion of full bloods were in the northeastern section of the nation, right here in the mountainous region. It's the, the southernmost tip of the Appalachian Mountains. And then in this far western and southern area where it's bordering the Choctaw and, I'm sorry, where it's bordering the Chickasaw and Creek um, nations. Okay, so in these areas, there was the highest concentration of full-blood Cherokees. They also had the lowest amount of measurable wealth and fewer indicators of acculturation. So they had... Um, smaller sized farms, uh, they had lower crop yields, they owned fewer slaves, but they were also able pr to preserve tra traditional Cherokee life ways in these areas um, for longer and kind of in, um, in isolation. They were away from Interstate turnpikes, and they're away from major waterways, which produced heavy white traffic. So they were away from this heavy white traffic that was going on in other areas. And they were also um, not as infiltrated by missionaries in these areas. Okay, so there's also a comparison of between communities with... Um, more full-blood individuals and communities with more individuals who have part Cherokee, part white ancestry. And so he finds that the more full-blood communities own fewer slaves, they're less likely to be a mechanic, less likely to read English, and more likely to read Cherokee. And the communities with more um, individuals of mixed Cherokee and white ancestry are more likely to own slaves, um, more likely to be mechanics, more likely to read English, and less likely to read Cherokee. Okay, so the conclusions are that the areas with a higher proportion of mixed Cherokee white ancestry tended to have more wealth, um, and they tended to own more slaves and the number of slaves that they owned increased over time. Um, between 1809 and 1835, the number of slaves um, probably tripled in the Cherokee Nation. And this is, um, this is consistent with, with what's going on in the nation, with national trends of the increase of slavery and in terms of slavery becoming more of a southern institution. Um, by the early 1800s, slavery is becoming less profitable for northern states. Um, and with the event of the cotton gin, and cotton is a major cash crop in the south, 
cotton, I'm sure you all know, has become king in the South by the early 1800s. And so this leads to this internal slave trade that's going on. And so you have northern slave owners who are selling their slaves to plantation owners in the South. And so the number of slaves in the South is increasing. Um, um, probably one of the most horrific, or I mean, I guess everything about slavery is horrific, but um, this always struck me um, as, com as especially harrowing. The internal slave trade um, really increases the, the amount of um, families that are split up, taking children away from their parents. And so you're, you're never going to see your um, family and friends again. So that's what's going on with the internal slave trade. Um, there's also increased demand for cotton because of the rise of the textile industry in the north. And there's a demand for cotton um, in throughout the world. I mean, by 1850, three quarters of the world's cotton um, supply is coming from the American South. So, and, and the Cherokees are part of that. Um, these these elite Cherokee families who have these large, large plantations who are cultivating over 160 acres and have over 100 slaves, they're part of this national and global economy. Okay, so compared with the, with the middle class, um, so this, this wealthy class comprises about 1% of the population and the middle class comprises about 20% of the population and just comparing um, they would cultivate on average of 14 acres, where the wealthy class would cultivate an average of 162 acres. So you can see the, the class distinctions there. There is a definite distinction in class by 1835. Could I ask, is this the same sort of classification for whites in this area? Um, it, it would be similar. Uh, as far as like the, the large plantation owning um, whites, that would be a small percentage of the population. Um, and in fact, it, most of the whites in the South, if they were slave owners, they owned one or two slaves. Um, a smaller percentage of this wealthy class, um, or a smaller percentage of all slave owning people were owned 10 or more slaves. So, so yeah, it, it was similar in the rest of the South. And I mean, it was these people that had the large plantations and hundreds of slaves. Um, they were also kind of at the top of the um, government structures. And so they were creating laws t that enabled them to perpetuate their wealth and kind of kept middle class or poor whites um, at a disadvantage. So, yeah. Absolutely, yes. So, I mean, when you're in the mountain regions, it's harder to um, cultivate the land, and there's poor soil, and so, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, okay, so how did, how did removal affect this class structure? Um, and the answer is it, it really doesn't affect it that much. Of course, there's a disruption during removal and right after, people lose their property and their businesses from the southeast when they have to move to the west. But families are able to find new sources of revenue. The resources um, are similar in Indian Territory as in the southeast. And so they're able to kind of pick up where they left off. After removal, several hundred Cherokee families become wealthy as merchants, tavern keepers, cattle ranchers, millers, salt work operators, and um, traders, including slave traders. That was a lucrative business. There is a thriving riverboat traffic along the Arkansas River that allowed them to trade down the Mississippi all the way to New Orleans and then up the Ohio all the way to Pittsburgh. So again, the Cherokees are part of this national and global economy. There we go. Okay, so um, 
we still have this this small class of wealthy Cherokee elite. Um, the image on the left is Hunter's home. It's the home of George Merle, who married Minerva Ross. She was the niece of Chief John Ross, daughter of Lewis Ross, who was the wealthiest man in the nation. Um, during the Trail of Tears, George Murrow moved with his wife's family to Indian Territory, um, where he settled in Park Hill. He established a plantation, built a large frame home similar to the ones that um, he saw in Georgia. And this is a Greek Revival style home. And he named it um, Hunter's Home because he was so fond of hunting. He had outbuildings on his property that included stables and barns for his horses, a blacksmith shop, um, and small cabins for slaves and employees, and a smokehouse and a grist mill. So Merle and his father-in-law, Louis Ross, also established a mercantile um, business in Park Hill. So they, they continued to um, figure out ways to make money once they got to Indian Territory. And the one on the right is the antebellum home of John and Mary, Mary Ross, who was his second wife, Mary Stapler Ross. Wealthier farmers invested in fencing, in land, and in more slaves. The vast majority of Cherokees at the time were um, small subsistence farmers, just like in back east. Um, they built their own homes. They cleared their own land. Um, they plowed it with a horse or a mule. Um, they lived in double log cabins. Um, they owned hogs. Maybe they owned a cow. They had few furnishings. Uh, in fact, many slept on the floor. Um, women and children over 10 would help in the fields. So they are living lives that are similar to the, um, the poor frontier homesteaders. That's what we're seeing. And if there was a drought or a bad crop, then the husband would sometimes have to work as a day laborer or as a sharecropper. And again, these areas are predominantly full-blood Cherokees. And their worldview is one in which they value self-sufficiency. Um, they don't value the amassing of wealth and comfort. Um, they still value living in harmony, just like in the Southeast in their homeland. They still value living in harmony with um, nature and in equality with their neighbors. Okay, so why are we spending so much time talking about class? Um, Differences in economic class often lead to differences in worldviews and in attitudes and in values. So that's what we're doing, and we're going to look at the male seminary as a case study for understanding these differences in values and worldviews. Okay, but first I want to give you a brief background on why tribal leaders created the male and female seminaries. These schools were controversial when they were created, and they remain so today. While some admire the school's classical training and intellectual culture, others see it as just another um, weapon in the war for assimilation. They see it just as another um, tool for assimilation and cultural loss. But my, exactly, yeah, kill the, Kill the Indian, save the man. No, you're absolutely right. No, that was the, um, the famous quote of Richard Henry Pratt, who created the Carlisle Boarding School. Kill the Indian, save the man. So what do you, what do you all think that meant when he said that? The only way for Native people to survive in a European-American-dominated society was to become European-American as much as possible. Right, absolutely. The Indian culture the same. Indian people as a distinct group. Yes, that's right. By making them undistinct. Nice, Mark Dolph. Very good. Um, this, Mark Dolph is our curator of history. He's the, histor the history expert. So. <laughs> okay, so my research, however, has revealed um, that 
the seminaries were instead an example of accommodation. Accommodation is the act of making adjustments to meet the demands of new circumstances. Um, or another way to say it, what some people would call assimilation, other historians would say it's actually the acquisition of sufficient skills for economic survival and political autonomy. And so that's how I'm looking at the creation of the seminaries. So one of the most important lessons for Cherokee leaders from 1794 to 1840 was that no matter what they did, they would never be integrated as equals in the United States. And that's kind of going along with what others have said. They accomplished so many of the improvements, so many of the aspects to where they would be considered civilized, but it didn't make a difference. Um, there were still tenacious efforts to remove them, and this made them realize that they had to create their own leaders, they had to rely on themselves. Uh, and it made them realize that they had to create, or they had to train future generations to be tribal leaders. These people are going to have to learn how to manage the economy, sustain their political structure, and bargain effectively with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the federal government. So in the years following forced removal, tribal leaders are asking, how are we going to prevent future assaults on sovereignty? And their answer was education. Arm young Cherokees with the best education possible so they will be on equal footing with whites. To many tribal leaders, the Cherokee Male Seminary was the best weapon in the ongoing battle for sovereignty and self-determination. Okay, so between 1817 and 1851, well really starting before that, I guess the first Moravian missionary got to the Cherokee Nation in um, the late 1700s. So missionary school rooms over time replaced traditional education as Cherokees placed increasing emphasis on English literacy and other practical skills. However, the issue was the United States government um, often collaborated with the missions um, to interfere with tribal affairs. And so once the tribe gets to um, Indian Territory in 1841, they pass um, the Education Act and they create this massive public school system and they're doing this to try to take control over their own education. Um, they still let missions stay, but they're trying to also have um, control over the common schools and the primary schools. Okay, so at mission schools, full blood students struggled. Um, Usually the teachers were not bilingual and they did not have effective teaching methods for um, teaching English. And so at first the tribe was very excited for this public school system, for this common school system. However, once it got um, going, they realized that the teachers were still predominantly white, still not bilingual, and the full blood children were continuing to flounder. So the answer was to create two high schools, the male and female seminaries, which the council passed an act in 1846 to create these two institutions, one for males, one for females. And the goal was to um, create teachers who were bilingual. and these teachers would teach in the common schools. The objective of these institutions was to promote, also to promote religion, morality, and knowledge, um, which are, they said, important to the preservation of liberty, liberty and the happiness of mankind. So because many full-blood parents viewed these mission viewed the missionaries in common schools with suspicion, they welcomed the idea of these high schools. Um, they're thinking, finally, we're going to have some bilingual Cherokee teachers in our common schools teaching our children. Um, so there were actually two goals to the seminaries. One was the bilingual teachers, 
And the other was John Ross and other tribal leaders are trying to train the next leader, the next generation of leaders for the Cherokee Nation who could defend tribal sovereignty. And while the female school trained young women to become teachers and wives of the Cherokee leaders, the male seminary, quote, prepared the boys for a university education and they were expected to return to become political leaders and businessmen in the Cherokee Nation, end quote. So during its operation, the male seminary achieved this goal. It provided Cherokee youth with the same advanced education offered at top tier schools in the Northeast. The council approved the sum between $60,000 and $70,000 to build the two seminaries, which ultimately ended up costing closer to $80,000. A committee was chosen to observe the pedagogy of New England schools and colleges to develop the curriculum at the male and female seminaries. So this committee traveled to New England and they observed um, teachers in classrooms at Mount Holyoke and at Boston Latin School and at um, Lawrenceville Academy in New Jersey and that's what they based the curriculum from. And the tribe also recruited teachers and principals from Mount Holyoke, Harvard, and Yale. So they created these two schools. And John Ross said, we're creating these schools in which, quote, in which all those branches of learning shall be taught, which may be required to carry the mental culture of the youth of our country to the highest practical point. Okay, so the early years, the early years, it was open from 1851 to 1856, and those are known as the early years. It closed in 1856 because of a drought, and um, then the Civil War um, devastated the nation, and so they didn't reopen them until 18, 1874. Okay, so the early years represented John Ross's vision for an advanced education. Any hopes that bilingual teachers, Cherokees, would graduate and teach in the common schools were quickly shattered. That was not happening. Um, after the seminary had been open for only a few years, it became very clear that this was only serving one class of Cherokees. And the largest proportion of the Cherokee populace, the full bloods, were left out. Um, John Ross had established institution, institutions <coughs> that served the wealthy Cherokees of part white ancestry. They had crafted their own advanced schools complete with academic excellence, with selective admission, and with social elitism. As the schools got underway, it became increase, increasingly clear that a specific class of Cherokees are benefiting from these schools. The entrance exams were very hard. Um, and so only students who had had um, a really good edu primary education, who spoke English at home, who um, had had private tutors, those were the children that were able to pass the entrance exams. And in the early years, there were only four or five full blood students out of 200. Okay, so once they were admitted, students faced a grueling daily schedule. Like off-reservation boarding schools of the late 19th century, students at the male seminary endured a stringent daily schedule. Um, they were allotted 7.75 hours for exercise and cleaning, 8 hours for classes, 8.25 hours for sleep. So each minute of the students' lives was planned. The young, the young men also endured a challenging curriculum that grew increasingly difficult as they advanced. So during their freshman year, they studied arithmetic, algebra, U.S. history, um, civil government, and grammar. By their senior year, they're studying psychology, um, English literature, political economy, zoology, logic, trigonometry, and the works of Virgil and Cicero.
Okay, so the dual goals of the male seminary combined with a diverse student body once you got into the later years resulted in um, complex assessments of the school by scholars, tribal members, and the students themselves. And so the seminaries are kind of um, setting at odds two distinct attitudes in the Cherokee Nation. And so because economic class can inform values and worldviews, we're going to look at okay, um, how the students, what the, what the students' attitudes are telling us about the Cherokee Nation in a larger context. So a lot of the students glorified the privilege and power held by those Cherokees who adapted to the white world. So there's a student newspaper, the Sequoia Memorial. Um, in addition to keeping the students current on tribal news and professional advice, some editorials also revealed students' aversion to traditional culture and their disdain for their uneducated Cherokee ancestors. The student newspaper circulated throughout the nation, so any full blood who could read Cherokee knew about these views. And I've got one quote here, and it's long, but it's a really good quote. Um, one student wrote, does not the heart of every Cherokee parent swell with the emotions of pure delight as he or she passes through the intervening prairie and beholds on either side one of the stately edifices which has been erected by the wisdom of our nation and dedicated to the intellectual and moral culture of her youth. In other words, fond parents, are not your very hearts filled to overflowing with pleasure when you see us, your sons and daughters, drinking of this fount of knowledge? Do you not look forward to the time when the dark clouds of ignorance and superstition and idolatry, crime and misery shall vanish before the rays of light that are to shine forth from these walls. Does not a hope spring up within your breast in which you see your country ranking among the most enlightened and Christianized of the world? Our teachers are kind and accommodating and ever ready to impart to us useful knowledge, knowledge that will qualify us to perform the necessary transactions of life and prepare us to move in the high circles of society. The great and glorious object is our elevation. It was to unrivet the chains and that fetter genius in the ignomi, I'm sorry, <laughs> ignomi, I can't even pronounce this word, ignominious valley of heathen darkness that it might ascend the hill of science and bask in the sunshine of pure refinement. Okay, so there's a lot going on in that quote. First of all, he's a very good writer. Like, he's obviously receiving a high-quality education at this school. Um, but second of all, you're seeing some worldviews and attitudes that, are, that you're seeing in 19th century antebellum uh, white America as far as um, these ethnocentric views and the valuing of white. Uh, culture over others. And so um, you're going to see kind of these, these racist ideas and attitudes being echoed also at the female <coughs> seminary. Um, and there is one instance when the girls were getting ready for a play, they were putting on a play, and one of the full blood um, girls wanted to be an angel, and one of the lighter skinned girls said, you're too dark to be an angel. So, um, so again, you're seeing kind of these attitudes in mainstream American um, society being reflected at these schools and also being reflected in the Cherokee Constitution. The Cherokee Constitution of 1893, Article 3, Section 5 states, no person who is of Negro or, or mulatto parentage either by their father's or mother's side shall be eligible to hold any office or prof, uh, of profit, honor, or trust under this government. It goes on to say, be it enacted by the National Council that intermarriage 
shall not be lawful between a free male or female citizen with any slave or person of color under the penalty of such corporal punishment as the courts may deem it necessary and proper to inflict and which shall not exceed 50 stripes for every such offense. But any colored male who may be convicted under this act shall receive 100 lashes. Okay, so you're seeing these are the kind of um, slave codes that are in state constitutions in the southern states. You're seeing this also in the Cherokee Constitution. Sure. Yes, yeah, so this is a, photog a photograph from 1994. So all the photographs that I have are from the later years. Yes, um, there weren't photographs from the first five years, unfortunately. Um, so all of these are going to be from the later years, and there were some changes made in the la later years that I'm going to talk about in a minute. But still talking about the early years, um, one student at the male seminary went so far as to describe the United States as the most enlightened and Christianized nation of the world. <coughs> okay, so these students needed to no, look no farther than the seminary library to reinforce their ethnocentric views. Of the 43 books on religion and history and philosophy, all but seven were about Christianity and none talked about Native American religion. Sim similarly, all the historical books dealt with famous and powerful Western and Anglo-American males such as Julius Caesar, um, Louis XIV, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, none were about American Indian history. And not surprisingly, there were no classes about Cherokee history or traditions or culture at the male seminaries. Okay, and so there's kind of another element to um, attitudes among the Cherokee male se seminarians. And they also espoused mainstream Anglo-American views of gender and masculinity. So the seminary catalog states that the military drills were not only to promote a knowledge in military science, but also to cultivate a manly bearing. And again, students in the Sequoia Memorial are talking about masculinity and manliness. And one student wrote, education is worthy of our sincerest veneration, our most manly actions. Another student um, praised Cherokees for their energetic and manly spirit. Future Principal Chief Joel B. Mays, who attended the male seminary in the 1850s, he wrote, let us touch those strings of feelings whose melodious music vibrates from the very bottom of our simple yet manly hearts. So these particular students' notions of gender reflected the views of editors in popular um, newspapers in Cherokee Nation, like the Cherokee Advocate and the Indian Arrow. An article in the Cherokee Advocate featuring tips on how husbands should treat their wives, stated that, quote, the superiority of man has always been acknowledged, but a husband should have manly enough understanding not to assert it over his wife, end quote. The article goes on to warn husbands to rule their homes with gentle authority. Another article asserted that, a wom quote, a woman's duty is the happiness of her companion and instructs wives to arrange your household to suit his tastes and wants. Clearly, antebellum notions of power and dependency between husbands and wives were evident in Cherokee society. And it's important to note that the editors of the Cherokee Advocate and the Indian Arrow were members of this wealthy elite class. Okay, so notions of manhood often intersected with views of race as the seminary students struggle to define their identity. They struggled to define what it meant to be a Cherokee and what it meant to be a Cherokee male. 
So many of these students spoke of their Cherokee ancestors with surprising contempt. One student said, do you not look forward to the time when the dark clouds of ignorance and superstition shall vanish from these, okay, I read that earlier, I'm sorry. Okay, commenting on the virtues of the tribe, one student wrote, Cherokee ancestors were the bravest of the brave, the noblest of the noble, the most successful in a chase, and the most dreaded in war. So you have some students who are clearly um, denigrating traditional Cherokee culture and others who are praising it. And so you've got a lot of ambivalence among students about what it means to be Cherokee. So they're struggling with their own identity. And I mean, it's understandable. They're members of the Cherokee Nation, but they're going to the school that's saying, you're going to be better if you're not Indian, if you're white. And so they're struggling with what it means to be Cherokee and how do they value Cherokeeness? How do they value whiteness? And so you can see why there's internal conflict. Okay, so in the 1870s, tribal leaders overhauled the, ma the male seminary to include Cherokees of all classes and skill levels. They added an indigent program, a primary department, and a manual training element. And the council's message was clear. The Cherokee public schools, including the male and female seminaries, were to promote the education of all Cherokee children, not just one class of Cherokees. Okay, so the council began charging boarders $5 a month or $45 a year. Um, and this monthly charge was for boarding, washing, lodging, lights, fuel, mattress, room furniture, and textbooks. Um, but they did continue to subsidize tuition. And the thinking was that if they subsidize tuition, then they can keep the wealthy families from sending their children to academies out of state. They want their children to stay in the, um, in the seminary, to stay in the nation. But they also provided financial assistance to fam families who could not afford the $45. So students from the poorer families were admitted as indigents and receive, received subsidized clothing and food and supplies. And they didn't have to pass entrance exams. So these children often lacked basic elementary education. And so obviously they're not going to take these advanced classes that the rest of the seminarians are taking and so they created this primary department. Um, which taught mostly younger, but some older students, the basics of the English language. The primary department offered three years of elementary classes and attracted children from the Cherokee speaking class whose ages ranged from nine to 21. And then they also added this manual training element. And they said that not only elements of gardening and farming but some of the mechanical trades, such as blacksmithing, carpen carpentering, wagon making, shoe making, and the like, are entered into the daily avoca avocations of life. Um, I remember when I talked to Dr. King about this topic and about the changes that they made to the male seminary in the 1870s, um, he had kind of a different take on it. He, his theory was that they made these changes and added this manual tra training element because um, they had outlawed slavery in 1866. And so now they needed to train people to do those types of jobs that slaves used to do, which is actually a really good theory, and I never thought of that before. Um, so in 1910, oh, there's another picture of the male seminary. So in 1910, um, the school burned down. Um, two students who were rejecting um, the assimilation policies, the assimilation bent of the schools, um, burned the school down in 1910. And so that was the end of the male seminary. Um, but despite that, and no matter what you think of it, whether you think of it as a uh, paragon for higher learning or um, a, 
a tool for cultural destruction, it did have an important impact on the Cherokee Nation and it trained, um, it trained hundreds of Cherokee young men. And so, does anybody have any questions? Sure, okay, so it burned down in 1910, and, I'm sorry? Where? Oh, this was in, this was um, just a mile and a half west of Tahlequah. And then the female, the original female seminary was in Park Hill. And that building burned down in 1887. And they rebuilt the new one in Tahlequah in 1890. And that is the centerpiece of NSU today, the seminary hall. Um, okay, so yeah, so the, the school burned down in 1910, and so they tried to do a combined, a co-ed seminary with um, male and female students, and it did not work. Um, and I'm not sure why it didn't work. I don't know if the students didn't like it or what, but... Um, the female seminary became the Northeastern State Normal School and started teaching, tr um, started training teachers. So, yeah, yeah. As I view the exhibit, I'm amazed at the level of education of some of the dignitaries in the Cherokee Nation. Right. Were they, product, were they probably products of this schooling? Yes, many of them were, and they were very proud of the fact that they went to school there, and it was kind of a thing that ran in families. Um, fathers would send their sons there and it would become a family tradition to go to the male seminary and the female seminary. Yeah. Yes? Were these seminaries unique to Oklahoma? Okay, so there are other um, academies in Oklahoma for um, different tribes. The thing How that... Throughout the rest, the rest of the Midwest. Okay, so yeah. Um, well, let me talk about Oklahoma first. The thing that was unique about the um, Cherokee seminaries so you have the Bloomfield Academy for Chickasaw females in Durant, and um, that at one point was it was for, it was started by missionaries, so it was owned and controlled by missionaries. Then it passed to the control of the tribe, but only for a short period, and then it passed to the control of the federal government. So the distinction is that the Cherokee seminaries were the entire time controlled. They created and run by the tribe themselves. So that's what sets these apart from other schools, and certainly from boarding schools throughout the West of the late 19th century. Yeah, yeah Mark. Maybe to add to that and to promote an exhibit that will be open hopefully by the end of next week. Yes. Um, we are going to have some baskets by a contemporary Native American artist. Her name is Shan Goshorn. She lives here in Tulsa. She is Eastern Band Cherokee. And she has created baskets. We will have seven sets. There's two baskets in each set that depict before and after photographs of Native children as they're going into Carlisle mm -hmm. Indian Industrial School at Carlisle, Pennsylvania. So this addresses your <coughs> question, John, that and I'm not sure that uh, Captain Richard Henry Pratt, who established Carlisle, was influenced by what was going on here in Indian Territory. He actually served the Army at Fort Sill at this time. And just after right. the Civil War, he fought Indian, primarily at uh, Kiowa Comanche, um, for his day. We should always look at people in their own time. I would consider him a progressive, and he certainly believed that the only way to save Native people was to kill the Indian within them and make them more like me, uh, European American. Uh, but he had very progressive ideas on race relations. He commanded Buffalo soldiers, 10th Cavalry at Fort Hill, and always resented how they were treated, as well as Native Americans, how they were treated, not as full citizens, but he felt to get them as full citizens, they needed to be educated. Right. So he establishes Carlisle, and it is a government, U.S. government, not an Indian government-run facility. And that will spawn 
more of these Indian schools like Haskell in Lawrence, Kansas, Chilaco, right. north of Ponca City, um, where Indian children will leave their homes and they will go to these boarding schools, often hundreds if not thousands of miles removed. But back to the exhibit we hope to have in place by the end of next week. These bas baskets have a photograph of the children in their native dress, often with very long hair and right. so forth, before they're admitted into Carlisle and then because Pratt is wanting to show the positive effects of this assimilation process, what was called the Americanization of Indian people, uh, there's an after photograph and they're in their suits or military type uniforms, their hair has been cut. Uh, there is some, and I think this is debatable, but some evidence that their skin tone is lightened in the after photographs, like somehow education has made right. them lighter right. or acceptable. Um, yeah, there's definitely some doctoring of the photos to make them appear lighter. No, we do that with photographs today. So, <laughs> uh, but it goes to what you were talking about, and my thought was, Americans have always believed that education is the magic bullet. It will solve all our problems. If we can just educate, fill in the blank, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, as this mass influx of southern and eastern Europeans are coming into the United States, they're going through the same process. We have to educate the little Italian, the Greek, the Russian Jew to make them more like us. And so those are somewhat modeled on these earlier right. attempts. Right, and then sometimes there, there would be this push to only provide a um, trade education or a um, mechanical, oh, thank you, vocational education for those immigrants. Um, and so some people uh, say that maybe that's what's going on with the Cherokee Male Seminary in the later years is that this trend that's going on in the nation to train minorities in vocational schools, maybe that's being applied to the full bloods in the Cherokee seminaries, so, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. I, I just add to this. The, the Carlisle activity was basically designed to create pan Indians or Carlisle Indians. It was not designed initially, not designed initially to do away entirely with, with Indian culture, which is what has been passed down, unfortunately. But uh, after after uh, Pratt was removed from, from Carlisle, it, it went the same route as all the other of, 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 of reservation schools, uh, the, the, this this notion, this notion that that, that the, the school was designed to destroy Indian culture was simply not true. Well, according to David Wallace Adams, who's an expert in Indian education, he wrote a book about Carlisle and other Indian schools, and he shows pretty, he makes a pretty strong case that actually that was the design of these schools, and that the pan-Indian consciousness that comes out of these schools was, wasn't by design, but it was kind of like an accident. It was an, it was an outcome from students going to the schools, and, you know, before you would have like a um, historically uh, to two kids from two different tribes who are historically enemies, and they would no longer think, that's my enemy, they would think we are both in the same, we're in the same boat here. We're going through this traumatic experience together, and that's what created the pan-Indian consciousness. Right, but the significance of that came out of the Carlisle Indian football team. That's, that's where the initial, initial whole idea of, of Indians together, and, and, and of course the Indians from, from tribes all over the country came to Carlisle. Right. So it had to be. It had to be a, a, a different sort of focus, focus on education than, than simply trying to to, you know, to to deal with all of these Indian tribes at the same time. Well, I would argue that Pratt, from the very beginning, was insistent that native languages were not spoken. And if you want to destroy a culture, one of the best ways, quickest ways to do that is to uh, eliminate the language because that is something that is passed from generation to generation. And if you yeah. take it from the youth. We're not going to pass it on the future generation. And that's another point about the Cherokee um, seminaries and how it was different from Carlisle and other boarding schools. They were still allowed to speak Cherokee, 
at the male seminaries. In class, they would speak English, but then when they were in their free time, they were still allowed to speak Cherokee. So it wasn't this assault on Cherokee culture like you had at other boarding schools. Yeah. yeah. I still have two questions. I was wondering if uh, there are lists of the enrollees that have survived who were in the Yes, seminary. there are. Um, um, the located? historian um, <coughs> Ballinger, um, I can't remember his first name, but he, yeah, his, um, his research, he's got a list of all of the students who attended, the students who graduated, and that is at the um, NSU archives. Okay. Yeah. They were supposed to be training to be teachers to go into more local That's areas. correct, yes. How, how did that work out? And so they did, yeah. That worked. Um, I, a, a lot of them did become teachers for local schools or became teachers in the seminaries. A lot of them became um, doctors or lawyers or bankers or, and they did serve the Cherokee Nation. So in that respect, it did achieve its goals of creating Cherokee leaders. Yeah. Am I out of time? No, you do answer a couple more questions. Sure. I want you to feel like you need to. Yeah, yes. We've had a, a, a painting on display of Father DeSmet's meeting with some Indians, and the story that went along with that was that he came out and treated smallpox, I think. Okay. Cholera. Well, I saw another similar painting to that, that where they explained that he traveled west and set up orphanages and schools, maybe a dozen of them. Throughout the West. Okay. Whatever happened to those? Um, well, the Cherokee Nation created an orphanage, um, especially after the Civil War, because there were so many orphans. Well, his orphanages were populated by, by children who were not necessarily orphans. I don't know they about were, that. They were turned over to the orphanage because the parents couldn't. Oh, I see. Okay. I'm not sure. Sorry. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you.